webinar today. It's already on, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me welcome, welcome you very warmly on the Novigado uh, webinar, Novigado project webinar. Uh, we'll meet today to discuss the new publications that uh, were presented uh, in the um, project consortium and are available on the website. And uh, we're, uh, who we are, uh, let's start uh, with presenting my colleagues that we uh, would uh, run this webinar today. Uh, let me start with uh, Barbara. Uh, she's an active teacher in the Paderewski Secondary School in Lublin. This is east of Poland and uh, member of the Novigado team in the Think Foundation. And Marcin Zarut is a teacher from secondary school number five in Tarnów, south of Poland, and uh, teacher trainer and also uh, expert and member of, of the Think Foundation team that prepared uh, this uh, publication. And me, I'm the coordinator and leader of the project, of the Novigado project. Uh, and I work for the Think Foundation, uh, uh, running uh, educational projects, uh, uh, especially in the area of uh, educational spaces. Uh, so uh, the agenda for this meeting is uh, quite, uh, uh, not very long, but uh, quite um, uh, important. Uh, let me start uh, with a few words about the Novigado project, uh, where I present um, what we actually did uh, uh, in this uh, consortium and what you can use already. Then we would uh, pass the discussion to the new publication, which is dedicated to learning spaces and, uh, and pedagogy. And we will discuss what's inside in this publication, what are the uh, key elements of transition from the classroom uh, traditional class classroom into the innovating learning uh, environment and we also discuss some strategies that you can apply in your uh, lessons uh, and in your school buildings uh, and uh, and I, we feel that this um, some strategies could be uh, very um, uh, interesting for all schools it doesn't matter which buildings they are located in and we will close this webinar with discussing some challenges uh, concerning the transition from this uh, traditional, let's say, classroom to, to innovative learning space. Uh, the key information about the Novigado project, very short, uh, it's a, a project financed by the Erasmus Plus program. Uh, its duration is 30 months. We are at the end, mostly at the end, it's half of the year uh, till, till the end of the project, so we can share a lot of uh, interesting uh, materials to schools and to especially the to, to, to teachers and to uh, school principals because uh, what we did in uh, in this project is mostly dedicated to uh, practical uh, uh, pedagogical uh, learning uh, ideas these are the Novigado partners. Uh, Think Foundation, which I represent, and my colleagues, uh, is the project leader. It's uh, located in Poland, and we also have European Schoolnet from Belgium, uh, the school from Portugal, uh, the school from France, and uh, two uh, agencies from uh, ministries of education. One from the Turkey, which is Yegitek. Uh, this is Director Generator of Innovation and Educational Technologies in the Ministry of National Education in Turkey. And Research Canope is uh, uh, agency for the French Ministry of Education. The main objective of the, of the project is to support the transition uh, from this conventional or traditional teacher-centered classroom into uh, into the process that, um, uh, first of all, uh, places the, the, the student uh, in, in the center of it. And not only places it, but it makes uh, the student active. And uh, with the support of, uh, of both uh, technology and, uh, and uh, learning environment, we can see how the student uh, uh, develops and, and uh, learns actively. 
And in short, uh, what we already have uh, in, in the Novigado uh, project, um, uh, what you can use from the, uh, from the um, uh, project uh, website, we already produced uh, the active learning reference framework, which is quite interesting document uh, showing how to understand active learning nowadays. And it, it was quite uh, broadly reflected uh, with the studies, with, anal with the, um, analysis from uh, all over the world. We have produced the guidelines in learning space innovations, which we would discuss today. Uh, it's uh, supported by uh, 13 school cases from partner countries as well. We also have uh, a tool which is very interesting and very practical and useful for teachers, which is available from, uh, from the, directly from the website. It's a web app, it's an online scenario tool. And, uh, Two other elements uh, are uh, in the, the capacity building program. We started the pilot project, uh, projects in four countries. This, they, they already go and we, we have more than 20 schools participating. And we are in the course of preparing the MOOC. This would be in the winter, which would uh, sum up and uh, take uh, benefits from all our work in the project. This is the, this all uh, products could be uh, downloaded from, from the website. So, so feel free to visit uh, the Novigado project um, uh, blog. You will find all of them, all of them in, in the results section. All right, now I would pass the leading to my colleague, Martin, please. And I would uh, step back. Martin, and yeah, okay. Now, uh, welcome everybody. I hope you can hear me now. I would like to uh, present uh, five language versions of our guidelines. The document which was uh, published um, recently, and it includes theoretical also uh, as well as practical information about uh, using innovative learning spaces, flexible learning spaces. So I just posted the link to the chat and I think I can see that Eleonora also uh, pasted the link to from to the website from which you can download uh, those documents in your language versions. Uh, your language version, the, the, uh, there is English language version, Portuguese, French, Turkish and uh, Polish uh, language version. So uh, if you uh, use any of those languages, you are welcome to download uh, the version which is uh, close, uh, closest to you. Now, as far as um, the contents, the insight of the, the guidelines, the document which can be downloaded uh, in the PDF format. Uh, there are four chapters. Two of those chapters, number one and four, are mainly focused on the theory of why we should uh, put the learner in the center of the learning process and uh, the explanation of what kind of abilities and skills are important nowadays and how we can develop those skills. And then chapters number two and three are focused on the practical side. Uh, chapter number two includes information about six different learning scenarios and uh, there's detailed explanations of not only uh, about the lesson scenarios, but also about uh, the spaces uh, how to prepare spaces, a learning space for this, uh, for those types of scenarios. Uh, in chapter number three, you've got information about various practical strategies of um, active learning, which you can introduce into your classroom, and they have been uh, researched and uh, we gathered uh, all of them in one place for you to be able to access them um, and use uh, in your class.
classroom. Very important thing which uh, we focus in during uh, the work on, in the Novigado project is that it's not enough to have the tools which are important uh, to introduce active learning into your classroom. So the furniture is important, the technology is important, but you also have to have the skill set. So the abilities and skills or, uh, regarding how to use uh, those uh, types of technology and uh, how to uh, make use of the furniture in the best possible and efficient way. But even if you have the access to appropriate tools and if you have access to appropriate skills, you still have one thing which is crucial. And this is the mindset. The mindset of a teacher who is open to new challenges uh, which are connected with putting the learner in the center of the learning process uh, and which uh, make the teacher open to the needs of the uh, student. So if you have the tools and mindset and skills and then you are ready to proceed uh, to the information which we uh, gathered in the guidelines. Um, a very important thing, another uh, triangle which we, we think is uh, extremely important is that uh, it's not enough to use um, innovative technology, it's not enough to possess appropriate spaces, but we need to apply uh, contemporary pedagogy. And then if all those three elements are combined, then we can think about transforming our classroom into a flexible learning space. And what is important, uh, transformation should start with, with pedagogy. So when we are going to uh, to talk about the transformation of the space of the architecture uh, we are going to uh, to start with changing the mindset that Martin um, mentioned uh, which is the very beginning of introducing new new pedagogy in the school and uh, later on we are also going to talk through some models of uh, of the transformation of learning space and some steps uh, through which we can uh, we can transform uh, the spaces. Um, today we would like to give you a teaser of uh, of what is in the guidelines and what you can find uh, inside of uh, of this uh, th this uh, handbook. Uh, and we would like you to we would like you to be inspired uh, to take it to your classroom classroom and try it out. And when we talk about the space, we talk about the space as a third teacher. This is uh, a concept that was taken from uh, Reggio Emilia um, approach. Uh, so uh, Loris Malaguzzi, who was um, the creator of this approach. And he said that the first teacher of a child is uh, his parents, his or her parents. They are introducing the child to the world. They are uh, teaching them all the values, all, all, all the uh, attitudes. Uh, and later when the child goes to school, they have teachers who teach in that school. But they also have another teacher and this teacher is the space. The space that should be uh, creative, that should be flexible to allow uh, the child to develop the skills but also to allow um, the teacher to respond the, to the needs of the child. So uh, this space acts as a, as a support, as a supportive teacher for the other teachers in that child's life. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, so the first chapter of our guidelines uh, focuses on the justification for 
introducing innovative pedagogy into the classroom. And one of the most important things are the 21st century skills that we want to focus on during the lessons. And these are creativity, critical thinking, collaboration and communication. So the four C's of contemporary learning of the, uh, the 21st century uh, skills. And uh, apart from focusing on the subject matter knowledge that you want to develop and uh, expand during your lessons, uh, it's important that during every subject the teacher focuses on those for uh, 21st century skills. When we talk about uh, the spaces, um, we tapped into a theory by Thornberg, David Thornberg, who uh, suggested that all the learning spaces can be divided into four types. Um, one of them is called uh, the campfire, and this is the space um, which is reserved for storytelling when you can learn as a student can learn from experts in this case the teacher and this is uh, the mode of teaching which is probably uh, most typical for many schools where the teacher is the uh, the expert and the source of information and this is the uh, direct way of teaching. So this is the one which is uh, quite important and we wouldn't like to um, abandon it completely because we also understand the need for direct instruction, but with uh, making students more active. And the watering hole, the second space suggested by Thornberg, um, is the space for interaction, for peer learning, for discussing concepts, which leads to building knowledge in the minds of our students. So this time the role of the teacher is less important. The teacher steps aside and he no longer is the sage on the stage, but he becomes the guide on the side. And then when we think about uh, lessening the importance of the role of the teacher, the third space suggested by Thornberg is the cave. So the space for personal reflection, for learning on, uh, all the students can learn on their own. And this is also uh, the process which should have its place in a modern contemporary classroom. And the spaces which are required for any of these three types of uh, types of uh, learning, which I uh, already mentioned, uh, will be uh, described uh, in in our next uh, in the well next part of this uh, webinar. And the last uh, space mentioned by Thornberg is life. So this is the the place where um, students put their knowledge uh, to test, they learn by doing. This is the place where they can apply their knowledge. And this usually means uh, different types of uh, lab labs, laboratories, um, the place where this, uh, the skills which students have acquired uh, can be used in uh, practice. Um, one of our uh, partners in the Novigado project is the um, uh, FCL team uh, from European Schoolnet and uh, we are very uh, proud to learn from them and to tap into their knowledge and they want to share this knowledge with us and this is uh, what uh, we presented in chapters number two and three. Um, FCL is a real space which is located in Brussels and the space uh, is 
um, divided into six zones. Uh, and those zones are overlapping, uh, which means they are not uh, physically divided apart from the interact zone, as you can see in this slide. Uh, but during the today's webinar, we are going to focus on the uh, zones which are located uh, at the bottom of the screen, so interact, develop and exchange. Um, as you can see, the three top zones, um, investigate, create and present, are um, linked to the project uh, learning, project-based learning. Uh, so, uh, as we wanted to give you some kind of a teaser for this, uh, for our guidelines, uh, we chose the three um, spaces uh, from the bottom of the list that we are going to expand uh, upon and uh, delve into into more detail. And also when it comes to these three zones, uh, they are also uh, overlapping with uh, the um, previous um, sort of division. So uh, interact will be a campfire, um, exchange will be a watering hole and develop will be equal to uh, to cave. So they will differ um, when it comes to uh, the, the role of the teacher and the role of, of students uh, in that area. Mm -hmm. So um, what is meant by a learning environment? When we were uh, thinking about defining it, uh, we found quite a lot of research that was trying to, to summarize the characteristics of an effective learning environment. And one of those, one of these was um, the ones um, that was proposed by Dumont and um, Eastens. And they said that an effective learning environment is the one that makes learning and engagement central. So um, there is nothing more important in the space than learning. It ensures learning is social and often collaborative. It doesn't mean that it has to be collaborative all the time, but there is space, there is um, there is time for uh, developing collaboration, developing um, peer learning, uh, and it is a part of that uh, that learning environment. It is also attuned to learners' motivations and emotions, so uh, it can be responsive to the, the learner's needs and it can uh, respond to uh, the way they want to work, uh, to the chosen mode of work. Uh, it is acutely sensitive to individual differences. So in a flexible space, in a space that is able to, um, that we are able to adjust to different students, it's much easier to individualize learning because uh, we can uh, we can differentiate between different types of work between different um, learning zones and it's much easier to uh, give students uh, individualized uh, tasks it is also appropriately demanding for each learner and it uses assessment that uh, is consistent with its aim with a strong focus on formative feedback and promotes connectedness across activities and subjects in and out of the school. That means that uh, assessment is supporting the main goal of this learning space, which is learning. Um, and to go even, even further, uh, we would like to now to introduce you to some of the uh, learning zones and um, some activities that you might do in these learning zones in a certain setup. And as you can see, we're going to start with Interact. Interact is a learning zone when uh, the teacher plays a central role, um, but it resembles more of a traditional uh, learning space. So instruction is quite important. However, uh, there is um, interactivity with the students as well. So students are not completely passive in, in that zone. They respond to, uh, they interact with the teacher, but the teacher uh, takes the lead in, uh, in this kind of uh, zone. And uh, one of the uh, activities that uh, might be treated as, um, as interaction uh, might be a mobile debate. Mobile debate is um, a type of debate where uh, 
there is a virtual or physical line uh, in um, in the room. It might be a spectrum, so it might be uh, a line that represents two or um, yeah, a scale to different um, sides of, of spectrum, but it also might be a line that divides the room into, let's say, two or three uh, different spaces. And uh, participants are asked by the teacher, uh, the students are asked by the teacher to um, position themselves somewhere on that line or to approach the line if it's dividing the room into into different spaces. If they feel that they agree with a certain statement or uh, go back or position themselves towards the negative side or towards zero if it's a scale, uh, if they uh, do not agree with a certain statement. Uh, there is also a chance in that activity to talk through different uh, positions to discuss with the participants why they have chosen a certain position on the line, on the spectrum, or why they have um, um, possibly changed their mind during discussion, because the participants can also move throughout uh, the whole discussion. And um, we also the strategy. Is, yeah, the strategy is uh, quite uh, interesting as it doesn't require any furniture. So uh, talking about flexible learning spaces, we need to think about think out of the box uh, as far as the space is concerned. It's not always in, crucial to, to uh, have. Uh, access to advanced contemporary modern furniture, flexible uh, desks and so on, but sometimes it just the first step could be to get rid of, of the furniture or just to uh, change the place where the lesson um, takes place. So you can just go outside, go to the corridor, go to the schoolyard, go to the the nearby park and just use the space which is around you. It's important when you change your mindset and start seeing places which are located inside the school building. And this is one of the ways in which you can use this space, which is not usually thought about in terms of using it uh, for the photo which you can see on your screens comes from the workshops which were um, conducted within the Novigado project. The from uh, schools across Europe, across the um, participating countries. But, um, workshop where they could also experience. They not only learned about how to use flexible spaces in their teaching, but also they could experience uh, how to use the space and, and feel, get the feeling of how it is to be inside, to be one of the participants of the active learning process. Mm -hmm. Why do we think it is an interaction? So why do we think the teacher still plays uh, a bigger role here? Uh, because it is the teacher who asks the questions. It is the teacher who leads the discussion. Uh, and of course, students are um, talking through their, uh, their thinking. They are talking through their argumentation. But it is the teacher who is in control of this, this particular activity. So. Uh, even without furniture, it is possible to still interact during uh, during classes. Another activity uh, that might be used uh, as Another. interaction is uh, interactive lecture. Uh, An interactive lecture uh, is sort of a, um, a more active way to uh, to introduce students to new topics, to new um, uh, new subjects uh, when they still do not have much knowledge about a certain issue. Um, and this interaction can be done through asking questions during um, the lecture. They can be done by 
introducing um, some technological tools like a Nearpod, for example, or um, Mentimeter that is quite popular um, uh, and doing some making some breaks for reflection uh, and uh, mm, being able to check whether the students understand what we are uh, talking about, whether uh, they really gain the knowledge that you would like them to gain. Mm -hmm. And also you can make your lecture more interactive, even if it is a teacher-led lesson. Uh, if you ask your students to um, make use of uh, strategies like mind mapping, mapping or sketch noting, uh, just to realize that uh, they should not remain passive and just listen to the lecture as if they were listening to a podcast, which was very, very um, common during the mobile um, school, the distance learning, which we experienced uh, during the last year when students uh, became quite passive during some of the lessons when the teacher wanted the, to uh, engage them in any way possible, but uh, this passive mode of participating in the lesson sometimes carried out into uh, the um, the teaching and uh, the types of uh, lessons which we um, started in September uh, in the stationary mode. Uh, students somehow, the, somehow their mindset remained in this um, um, distance uh, education uh, mode and now it's important to make them more active. Okay, the second space uh, is exchange. Exchange is a space where which fosters collaboration between the students and teachers sort of steps down a little uh, they play, uh, teachers pr play a supportive role here. They are being fa the facilitators of, uh, of learning and uh, they are on the side. They are there when they are needed. However, it is the students, um, students' responsibility to build that knowledge in collaboration uh, with some other students. And one of the activities that we can propose for exchanging uh, is a fishbowl discussion. This was one of the discussion, one one of the methods that uh, probably uh, was the most discussed during our uh, our uh, workshop with the teachers, at least in Poland. Uh, and it, uh, I think, uh, um, sort of stimulated the most emotions. It is not a, an easy method, uh, and uh, it might be quite difficult to. Uh, convince the students to do it for for the first time, but it's worth trying. So the method is about creating two circles. The inner circle is a circle where uh, when, where participants discuss on a certain topic. It might be a discussion that is completely free flowing, or it might be the discussion that is, uh, let's say, a, a little bit stimulated, a bit led by the teacher who asks more questions or leads the discussion into the uh, the areas where he wants the students to go. The outer circle uh, is a circle of observers. Uh, people who are in the outer circle circle have uh, a person in the inner circle uh, that they are observing. They also have a protocol uh, which they are going through uh, in the observation. So they are checking whether, for example, uh, the uh, person is actively engaged in the discussion. They might be also commenti commenting on some subject specific uh, things, but also from the sort of meta um, perspective uh, about um, um, skills that a certain person possesses. After the discussion, uh, both the person from the outer circle and inner circle meet and uh, the person from the outer circle can give feedback to the student from the inner circle. 
And so, also a yeah. word of explanation regarding the slides. Whenever you see the small icon, the miniature icon of the guidelines in the top right hand corner, it means that the material is uh, to be found inside the guidebook and you can uh, expand your knowledge uh, and find some practical examples of using this strategy inside uh, the guidelines. Mm -hmm. This was, as I said, one of the activities that was most discussed during workshops as we tried it with, uh, with the participants. Um, it's not an easy method to do it first. Uh, it requires um, quite a lot of planning, pre-planning for the activity. And it also might not be very comfortable as a first time activity. Uh, but it is worth to trying it again and again because it is an excellent method to um, both teach uh, the, the students to engage in discussion, to go to teach them collaboration, to teach them argumentation, listening to each other, but also to teach them uh, peer assessment, which is uh, um, a skill, which is an activity that is often forgotten uh, in, in the schools. So, um, it serves both purposes. Another strategy that um, is presented in the guidelines and also which was used during uh, the workshop within the pilot program uh, is uh, one of the thinking routines and think per share where students um, are given a topic or a problem and then uh, they start by thinking about the topic or problem on their own and then the second stage is when they find a partner to talk to and then they exchange the, their ideas um, and the last stage of this thinking routine is when they uh, get together and during a plenary session they share uh, the things which they developed uh, during the previous stages. And we also used this um, strategy during the workshops. I'm not sure if you can see the photograph here because I can't see it on my site. I don't know why, but uh, you need to believe us uh, that uh, students in this photo are really working together in pairs and it also Mm, the strategy is Martin, not another click, just click. Ah, ah, OK, yeah, that there. was that was cool. Uh, so um, you can see that it's also not really demanding as far as the space and the furniture which is needed to conduct uh, this type of uh, strat activity in your classrooms. One other um, activity that might be used for exchange is Jigsaw. And there are many different versions of, uh, of Jigsaw discussion. Uh, so um, one of them is, um, or I just noticed that we have a photo in Polish. <laughs> um, one of them is to have focus groups uh, and to have four groups that work on different topics. And later on, when they regroup, they might uh, group so that in each group there is one person for each topic and they explain uh, the, the topic to each other. Another way to do that is uh, to, to use uh, the uh, tear up the book um, activity where you divide an article or a part of the book into different separate uh, parts and you give each group all the parts but mixed and uh, when they are um, talking through uh, or responding to a certain question they uh, need to communicate to each other uh, to for example uh, complete a product uh, that is the final uh, final stage of uh, of that um, that activity and uh, again uh, a photograph of um, of uh, how we did that activity we asked uh, the participants um, for that not only to uh, to um, read some of the materials, but also to look for 
do a, a small web quest uh, throughout the uh, the discussion in different uh, different panels. So again, this is a, a nice way to introduce students to collaboration and uh, possibly also to include some um, ICT tools. Mm -hmm. Another strategy is a carousel brainstorm and uh, this activity um, requires students to be divided into groups and each group is given a different uh, place in the classroom where they have their own uh, flip chart or poster and they are asked uh, a question and then they list all their ideas related to the question or the problem on this uh, flip chart and after a certain time uh, they are asked to move round to the next station and work on the um, topic uh, or on the work, work on the flip chart which belong to another group uh, and expand the uh, the idea uh, develop it creatively add to uh, the topic or to maybe uh, challenge some ideas which were put on the flip chart by the previous group. And we also used this activity here and also again this is one of the activities which uh, is not really demanding in case of furniture, it just requires you to have some space uh, in the classroom uh, for students to move around uh, the posters, flip charts can be pl either placed on the walls or just on the tables. So uh, you can take your students uh, away from the school building and do this activity too. Mm -hmm. It might also be done uh, virtually. It might also be done in a form of a station rotation where one person stays um, as an expert for a certain poster and the other uh, people in the group move to, to another post poster. And the experts uh, um, are have the role of introducing the next group to the ideas that were previously conceived. And uh, one of the ways to, um, to present uh, the work of the students and not to waste a lot of time on the presentation is uh, doing a gallery walk. And it is a nice uh, activity that you can actually do after um, the, uh, the carousel brainstorm. So when the posters are ready, uh, students can simply uh, go through all the posters and read uh, or listen to some um, single people talk about uh, about their posters uh, and this can be done in rotation so uh, all the uh, presentations are taking place in the same time and students move between uh, between the presenters this is a very nice and quick way to uh, to go through the products of uh, of the uh, exchange work of the of the collaboration between the students and here you can see some photos from the workshop conducted by us in, in Warsaw. Um, when you talk to students and when you mention project project based learning, one of the stages which some of the students really hate is the last stage, the presentation stage where they are asked to uh, watch 10 various presentations by 10 different project groups one by one and uh, after they have presented themselves they are sometimes not really interested in the presentations carried out by other groups and this is gallery walk is one of the ways to get around the problem and also you will find uh, a detailed explanation of this strategy inside the guidelines. Another way to do that, which I sort of mentioned uh, a second ago, is um, a world cafe, which is also described in the guidelines. And here uh, it's a little bit like a carousel brainstorm, but you might have more uh, complicated questions uh, that are being asked in different tables. And there is also uh, in each table, there is one um, expert 
who facilitates the discussion. It might be a student expert. It doesn't have to be teacher at each table. So it might be student experts who are either familiar with a topic or were pre prepared uh, for the for the activity. Um, and um, they introduce um, the other students to this activity, to the question, to some of the aspects of the question that they are going to discuss. And again, the participants can change. The expert stays with the table, but the participant participants can move between the tables to engage in more questions. Another strategy is concentric circles. And this also can be done in any open space uh, in the uh, outdoor space uh, of your choice, which is especially important as far as the pandemic is concerned, because we haven't mentioned yet that uh, we uh, were working on the guidelines with the idea that uh, uh, the activities uh, which we describe uh, should also um, take into consideration the fact that uh, either you can um, abandon your classroom and go somewhere uh, outdoor or you can conduct uh, most of those activities in the distance learning mode um, during uh, mo um, distance lessons and uh, you will find some ideas of how to transform uh, the uh, active learning strategies into the virtual reality settings using uh, virtual learning environments and uh, the most typical um, learning platforms which we all used uh, during the uh, remote learning. Mm -hmm. So for example, this activity can be done using uh, breakout rooms. Uh, when uh, we group people uh, in pairs, ask them to discuss a certain topic and then mix and match and change the pairs. So we can do it, for example, using breakout rooms and doing random um, pairing of, uh, of people. And the last uh, space uh, which or zone which we wanted to talk about during today's webinar is the develop zone. And uh, when we think about the Thornburg uh, uh, zones that we discussed earlier, this is the rough equivalent of the cave where students work on their own. This is the space for informal learning, self-reflection, uh, where the teacher uh, doesn't go in the way of the student, but it of course is available when the students needs him or her. Uh, but the main work is uh, done by the student and this is Mm, the, uh, the spaces which uh, can be suited for this type of learning uh, include various mm, uh, types of furniture, innovative uh, types of equipment. Uh, some of them uh, are visible on the screen now. And you can see that uh, a school which uh, is suited for this type of learning uh, is uh, one of them is uh, in, in Denmark, for example, um, but it can use various other types of uh, hammocks or uh, bean bags or any places which are uh, separated uh, from each other. And they also can include some places located outside of the, of the classroom. And one of the uh, strategies uh, that can be used within the develop zone is the flipped classroom where students are asked to work on the material before the lesson. They are asked to get acquainted with um, a film or a text uh, which was assigned by their teacher and they come to the classroom already prepared and ready to participate. And in this way, <clears throat> you can join this strategy with, for example, Fishbowl, where they already have some knowledge which they can share and exchange during the, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> during the uh, 
fishbowl discussion. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the activities uh, that we can use in uh, the uh, in the uh, develop stage is also a web quest. Uh, web quest is an activity where students uh, either individually or uh, in a small group, so it might be done also as an exchange, uh, answer certain uh, questions, um, a set of questions that, that is pre-prepared by the teacher. So uh, if we want to, for example, introduce the students to a certain topic, we we as teachers are pre-preparing some of the of the questions and by reading through different sources uh, and looking through the Internet sources, the students need to answer the question. And uh, the final outcome of the web quest might be a mind map, might be a presentation, might be a podcast or any other product really that we would like the students to uh, to present. Uh, as I said, if it's done individually by each student uh, mm -hmm. and sometimes we might want to have an individual task for the students, it might be uh, used as uh, as a develop method. Mm, the guidelines also include some ideas for implementing the process of transforming your school and classroom from the teacher-centered environment into a student-centered environment. And this uh, learning space spectrum shows seven stages of uh, what, what kind of um, activities you should uh, involve when you think about the transformation of your classroom. One of the things that we are really concerned, uh, firm about is that uh, students should also be engaged in this process as the stakeholders of the transformation process because um, sometimes uh, or it is important to listen to their voice and to uh, talk both to the students and to their parents about the environment that uh, should be introduced into the uh, school uh, building and into your classroom. So uh, if you engage all the stakeholders, um, they will take the ownership of the learning process and uh, you will have a chance to avoid the mistakes of uh, just forcing them into environment which were, they were not prepared for and which seems strange to them. And there were some cases where unprepared students uh, felt uh, that uh, they are not part of, of, of the process of the transformation and uh, this uh, was uh, one of the um, obstacles uh, that could um, have a, a negative uh, effect on the uh, whole process of transformation. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is another model of or strategies uh, to find a solution for uh, for um, transforming the architecture. So um, what you might do is firstly uh, to run it. So every school has some spaces that are not used. It might be wider parts of the corridor. It might be some uh, niches or attic spaces or um, spaces on uh, the lowest level of the school, uh, which might be adapted for learning, either formal or informal. Uh, what you might also think about is um, about splitting, so subdividing the spaces into different zones. Sometimes we are working in quite big classrooms when it is easy to have certain uh, spaces for, for example, individual learning and then separate spaces for uh, for collaborative learning uh, simply by rearranging the furniture or creating some dividers if they are needed. 
sometimes we are also able to connect different spaces. Uh, for example, by uh, tearing up walls, if we can do that in the school. It can be done physically, it can also be done uh, visually or functionally. Uh, so, for example, uh, connecting a classroom to the corridor, if it's uh, if it's possible. Uh, also, sometimes we can add uh, some extra spaces so we can add um, parts of the buildings or we can borrow the neighboring buildings to extend the grounds of the school. Uh, we can also borrow the outside space of the school, so lawns, parks, uh, some um, city spaces or village spaces where we are working, which can also become learning spaces for our students. And then, of course, going beyond. So using spaces, uh, public facilities that might uh, contribute to the learning process, museums, theatres, um, some um, community uh, spaces that we can use for uh, the learning purposes. And the last thing that we wanted to talk about today is uh, the contents of the last chapter, chapter number four of the guidelines. And uh, of course, it's important to understand that uh, there are some challenges related to the transformation process. So uh, we need to understand that the process of uh, transforming a teacher centered classroom into a student centered classroom is not easy. Um, it's important to understand that it's uh, good to start with the first easy steps, uh, sometimes using some of the strategies which we uh, presented today, which do not require expensive furniture, which do not require tearing up walls, but just require you to go out of the box and uh, literally go out of the school and uh, take your class into the schoolyard and Mm, use some of the strategies that we talked about. And uh, we decided to divide the challenges into three categories, the challenges related to the mindset. So um, we started the webinar by talking about the three requirements for any process to be successful. Uh, and this included the mindset, the skill set and the tool set. And this is reflected also in the challenges. So. Um, the headmaster must understand the need for the change. Uh, without him or her, uh, it's, it's sometimes impossible to carry out uh, some major um, transformations inside the school building. Uh, teachers as, a, as the staff of the school uh, are also one of the stakeholder groups uh, which should be um, actively involved in the process. So it's very hard for one teacher to uh, carry out all the changes uh, without the understanding of uh, the other um, uh, members of the staff. And I mentioned students, sometimes um, they may be reluctant to to become actively involved in the learning process, especially if they um, weren't used, weren't accustomed to uh, be actively involved before. And this is the what we could uh, observe in uh, distance learning sometimes, where uh, they were uh, or they had been used to be passive during uh, the teacher-led lesson, and then. Uh, during the distance learning, lots of teachers uh, uh, had problems with uh, making them more uh, engaged. And also parents, um, the last stakeholder group that we wanted to mention, uh, it's important to have good communication with parents and to communicate them the need to change the uh, typical structure to change the teacher centered uh, and um, uh, school into a, a school which is uh, focused on students, students' needs, and uh, students' abilities. Uh, some challenges are also 
related to the tool set which includes the infrastructure, the architecture, but also the furniture, ICT, and uh, of course the changes may require lots of uh, funding sometimes, uh, but uh, it's important to, if you, if you have the funding, it's important to uh, not to forget about the uh, pedagogy and about the skills that you need to have and your students need to have to be able to use this equipment uh, in a proper way. And the last uh, set of challenges is related to the skill set. So if you have the appropriate uh, mindset and if you are in, if you have at your disposal appropriate tools, uh, you need to uh, either acquire uh, the set of skills that will enable you as the teacher uh, to make use of this uh, of these tools and uh, make use of the the technology in a proper way <clears throat> uh, for uh, you you need to introduce your students to why collaboration is important why uh, the student autonomy is important and if they uh, possess the skills uh, and have this mindset and have the uh, tools available, you can think, uh, you can uh, hope for a successful process of transformation. And last thing I would like to add is that transforming your space uh, to suit the active learning methods is a collaborative task. So when you when you look at the challenges related to mindset, uh, one headmaster who believes that this is the proper way to do uh, things will not uh, be able to change the whole school environment. They need to engage other stakeholders. It is a group decision. It is a collaboration between headmasters, teachers, students, parents who need to understand why this change is going to happen and this is uh, not going to be only the visual change. Um, I think it is also worth mentioning that according to some of the research, uh, the flexible learning spaces and active methods will not change the grades of the students, so they will not change the results in the exams, for example, but they will definitely develop the skills of the students which is sort of in line with that 21st century learning um, priorities that we all have. Uh, we are not teaching for the exams, but we are teaching for uh, equipping the students with the best possible skills. And uh, changing the mindset, changing the, uh, the school into uh, a learning space that uh, allows for different types of interaction is also uh, requiring collaboration between the teachers. And uh, this is something that uh, I think is, is very important. Very often we as teachers work within, their sub within our subjects and we f feel a little bit lonely, uh, especially if we work in a small school where, where uh, we are the only teacher of a certain subject. So uh, the uh, the transformation of the spaces, the transformation of the mindset of the pedagogy uh, requires different teachers, different sub subject teachers to collaborate uh, with each other. And only then uh, we can uh, suspect that we will be successful in that transformation. All right. I think I think this is it. My colleagues already said uh, everything about or most of uh, important um, information about uh, our publication. So thank you very much for attending the webinar. And uh, now we invite you to uh, Navigado website to download the, the guidance the guidelines and uh, we hopefully we hopefully uh, they hopefully inspire you and uh, assist you in teaching practices. And uh, what is also important, uh, this is quite a universal material. So feel free to take it, uh, adapt it and, and develop it uh, because it's up to you and your invention and your innovation, 
how you implement uh, these ideas in your classroom and uh, in your school space. And what is what already has been said, you don't need the beautiful, uh, very modern uh, school building to start all these activities. You can start it everywhere in each classroom, even if you have very old building, uh, small classrooms. Uh, so don't worry, just try. Thank you very much in the name of the Novigado Consortium. Uh, I would uh, uh, now finish this webinar and uh, wish you all good in your learning practices. Thank you very much. And see you soon somewhere else on other webinars. Bye bye. Bye bye.